Hi, everybody. Welcome to our first Facebook Live chat. I'm Sharon Ross McGuire, the Chief Clinical Quality Officer for Bright Star Care. Uh, we're happy to be with all of you today, and we want to thank you for joining us. As I mentioned, this is our first ever Facebook Live chat, and so please excuse us if we have a little, a few hiccups along the way. But again, we're so grateful for you taking the time to be with us. My background is as a gerontological nurse practitioner for almost 30 years now, and I've had the distinct privilege of working with literally thousands of families and their loved ones living with dementia over my many years as a nurse. I've also been privileged to lead major organizations in efforts to design programs and systems and trainings for individuals caring for those with dementia. And here at Bright Star Care, I've been uniquely responsible with many colleagues, of course, for the design of our unique in-home dementia platform that we call Bright Star Connections. Today, we're going to be talking about safety, which of course is a priority for anyone living with dementia and anyone caring for those with dementia. We know that safety has a number of attributes and we're going to be tackling a few particular topics related to safety, namely falls, medications, and wandering. Now, certainly each of those topics could be a chat of their own. And as we're having our chat, please feel free to write any questions, and I'm going to try to answer as many as I possibly can. One really super thing is that following the chat, we'll have a great resource for you that'll be available on the Facebook feed that you can link to, and it's all about dementia-specific home safety issues. So be sure to click on that and use that resource uh, to help guide you in your efforts. Uh, as I mentioned, it's really been a privilege for me to work with families and those living with dementia. I know it's uh, a challenging journey many times, and I'm truly humbled to be with you today to share pearls of wisdom that I have not only utilized in my professional career, but in my personal career working with family members uh, and others who have dementia. So why don't we get started? Um, and by the way, let me remind you that this is our first of two Facebook Live chats. Uh, next week we'll be doing one sort of focused on navigating the holidays, which of course as we're coming upon Thanksgiving and other festivals uh, toward the end of the year, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, Christmas, and other events, that's really also a, a challenging time for many people with dementia. So let's get started though with talking about falls. Certainly many people with dementia not only have dementia, but they also happen to be old. Uh, it's not the case that dementia only affects people who are old, but we do know that many people who have dementia are also old. Why do I bring that up? We know that falls in the elderly uh, have certain attributes and certain risks associated with them that are true just because folks are older. But we also know that people living with dementia who happen to be old have additional risk factors. So what are those risk factors in general? Let's talk about risk factors for anyone, uh, but especially those who are older. We know that older adults often have challenges with vision and hearing. That can cause a greater risk for falls, especially as related to vision. They may not see things in their path that could contribute to a fall. We also know that older adults may have postural issues, gait and mobility issues, sometimes because of general muscle weakness in their lower extremities because of lack of physical activity, or because they may have underlying medical conditions like arthritis, for example, that could affect these issues. And so when we don't have strong lower extremities because of muscle weakness or we have joint issues that could contribute to instability, it absolutely puts anyone uh, at greater risk for falling. Also another factor to consider for really anyone, regardless of age, is medications. Um, older adults tend to take more medications than their younger counterparts, but certainly anyone who's taking multiple medications because of the potential side effects 
and the interactions of those medications is at greater risk of falling. We also know that individuals who take certain kinds of medications are even at greater risk. That's certainly true and unique related to uh, older adults with dementia that are often taking medications related to things like behaviors. In particular, behaviors that someone has prescribed medications known as antipsychotics or anti-anxiety agents. Both of these kinds of medications, again, regardless of your age, but especially for older adults, and especially for older adults with dementia, can pose significant risk of falling. And that's actually well documented in the literature. Now, let's think in particular about older adults with dementia. In addition to those factors I described for older adults in general, what in particular about older adults with dementia put them at risk for falling? Well, certainly all of you listening in, I'm thinking, have experience with loved ones with dementia, and you know that there are times when their judgment is impaired. They're not always very good at making great decisions when it comes to their personal safety uh, because of some of the impairments in judgment, also because of impairments in interpretation, especially as related to depth perception. So because of judgment and issues around depth perception, their risk of falling is even greater for an individual who's both old and demented. We also know that older adults with dementia and really any person with dementia may be prone to episodes of agitation and confusion. Uh, memory loss, of course, is a heralding characteristic of uh, all dementias. And each of these cognitive and memory issues absolutely contribute to a greater risk of falling. So that being said, we've certainly established that people with dementia do have great risk of falling. There was one study I read, now it's from about 10 years ago, so it is dated, but in this study, they talked about how older adults with dementia in their study group had a 70 to 80% chance of falling versus their non-demented counterparts. That was about twice the risk of the typical older adult falling. Now that was startling to me, uh, and certainly as a practitioner myself, I know that there are great risks for folks with dementia in terms of their fall risk, but that was really quite startling. So suffice it to say, we want to be very mindful of older adults with dementia and anyone with dementia to keep them safe and to reduce the risks of falling. So what would be a great way to think about reducing risks of falling? Someone on the chat asked, what items that are typically in a person's home are more likely to cause a fall? And associated with that, what are ways to prevent the falls? Great question, Terry, thanks for asking that. Many items in the home are uh, risk worthy or pose a risk for falls. Common things that um, are often spoken about but worth uh, emphasizing would be things like throw rugs. Now many of us have beautiful rugs around our home and they maybe contribute to our lovely interior design, but what they also contribute to is a risk of falling. Some of that simply is because the rug may not be well adhered to the surface on which you put it. Uh, maybe the edges are curled up, causing someone with, again, an impaired gait, uh, someone who doesn't have great postural stability to trip over that rug. And so throw rugs are a big no-no. Now, should you evacuate all of them from your home? Well, I would, to be honest with you, or certainly if you're compelled to keep a throw rug or an area rug, make sure that it's well secured with a rubberized bottom and that the edges are not rolling up. Other items in the home. Clutter is not uh, our friend. Um, we may all get a little uh, lackadaisical with uh, the nature of our home. I know I'm a little guilty of it myself. I sometimes have too much clutter around. Well, when I'm an old person with dementia and I may not be attentive to my surroundings, uh, clutter is not my friend. I may trip over things in my path because I may not have seen them. And so as simple as it sounds, it really makes a profound difference in reducing falls in the home to clean it up, clean up the clutter, make a clear path from point A to point B for areas of high 
um, mobility, what would that be? Well, if dad or grandpa or mom or grandma likes to sit in a certain spot in the living room and they know uh, and are capable of getting to the bathroom, but that path is cluttered, uh, make sure it becomes uncluttered, a nice, clear, clean, even path to that bathroom, whether it's from their favorite spot in the living room or from their bedroom is really, really critical. Another thing I wanted to mention about falls is related to footwear and foot care. Um, a lot of times we don't pay as much attention as we should to foot care and footwear. Now you might think, what does that have to do with falls? It has quite a bit actually. Think of uh, a proper, well-fitted uh, shoe with a proper rubber bottom, uh, how great that contributes to one's stability. For example, a great pair of tennis shoes versus a pair of shoes that are heeled uh, with little maybe kitten heels for the ladies out there, or a leather sole. These are, you know, an accident waiting to happen because of their instability and their slipperiness. And so providing great footwear that has a great bottom and a nice steady platform uh, really contributes to super stability. The other thing is foot care. Um, sometimes we don't pay as much attention to our little tootsies as we get older. And so what do I mean by that? If I have problems with my toenails, uh, maybe I've developed a fungal infection in my nail bed and my toenail is getting very thick and difficult to trim. Uh, maybe I have corns or calluses and while this may be an unpleasant topic, it's very important because if my foot care is lacking and my feet are actually painful and the foot wear becomes uncomfortable because my feet are not in good shape or good repair in terms of their toenails and other things, I can absolutely have an altered gait and a greater risk of falling. So paying attention and uh, obtaining great foot care and good footwear is really a very important part of the equation. Now, what other things should we be mindful of? I talked about those medications. Um, we know that older adults with dementia are often on medications that can contribute to a heightened risk of falls. And I'll talk about medications generally in a short while. But let's talk about medications specifically as they're related to a greater risk of falling in older adults with dementia. We know that there are times when older adults experience agitation, those living with dementia. And many times the prescriber, the physician or nurse practitioner that you're working with may choose to put your loved one on medications to slow down or help the episodes of agitation uh, such that it will potentially contribute to a heightened risk of falls. Now that's a tough uh, balance. I've been in that position myself. As a prescriber, I was often asked by clients or their families to prescribe something to help with agitation, to help with combativeness. I have to share with you that I really was always quite reluctant to do so only because I feel that there are many alternatives to use and there's some good research as well as my practical experience and uh, the experience of many others that there are non-medication ways to manage quite a bit of the agitation that you may be experiencing. Now that's not to say there isn't a place for certain medications, I completely understand that. But when you balance the risk and the benefit, it's very much a consideration as related to heightened risk of falls. So what kind of medications am I talking about? There's a whole class of medication called antipsychotics. Some of the older ones you may have heard the names of include things like Haldol and Melaril. We don't use those too often anymore. And some of the newer agents include drugs with the names of Risperdal, Seroquel, Abilify. And I'm not saying those are inherently evil, but if your loved one is prescribed medications like this, these are considered the class called antipsychotics, be very mindful that whoever the prescriber is needs to be a partner with you in watching for some of the side effects that can be worrisome. 
Now, please don't rush out and, you know, tell your um, friendly physician and prescriber that, oh, your loved one has to get off of these medications. But be mindful that you have a good review of the potential side effects and are discussing that regularly with the prescriber. Another class of medications that are sometimes prescribed for people with dementia and can contribute to falls are called benzodiazepines. Uh, they are often used for anxiety, sometimes for sleep. Common names include some of the older medications that have been around forever like Valium. Uh, some of the newer, although not terribly new agents, are known as Ativan or Xanax. Some of the medications used for sleep that fall into this category, a common one is called Restoril. Now again, I understand there's a role for these medications, but they are notorious for contributing to fall risk. And so I bring these up for you to be mindful that when your loved one is on these medications, there may in fact be a greater risk of falling. Now please, again, as I mentioned, do not take them off of the medications. Do not go running to your prescriber and say, we've got to stop these. But my point in sharing this is that you need to have great conversations with the prescribers to be aware of the side effects and manage those appropriately. Other things to do about falls. If I've left out any pearls of wisdom, which I'm sure I have, um, I'll get back to them. I'm gonna take a quick look at my note page and see if there's any little pearls I would be remiss if I didn't describe to you. Hold on. Ah, yes, how can I forget this one? Um, many times people with dementia often have challenges around eating and drinking. Now, how does that relate to falls? We know that dehydration can contribute to delirium. Dehydration can contribute to something known as orthostatic hypotension. Now, what is that? That's a problem wherein I stand up, my blood pressure may drop, and I become dizzy. And certainly that level of dizziness can contribute to my risk of falling. So going back to how can I respond to this for persons living with dementia, well, let's make sure that we're providing adequate uh, hydration. And that can be a challenge. Uh, a person living with dementia may not want to drink. Uh, they may not feel up to it. They may refuse to drink. And so providing liquids throughout the day is a great strategy to keep them hydrated. Things that they enjoy. Um, while coffee isn't ideal because of its caffeine content and may interfere with sleep and potentially contribute to restlessness, um, a little coffee is not you know, harmful. And if it's their beverage of choice, for example, in the morning, by all means, uh, give them coffee. And you certainly can use decaf, right? There's lots of options for decaffeinated uh, beverages, including coffee and other, um, other things. But maybe it's juice, maybe it's water, maybe it's water with a little flavor of lime or cucumber or something interesting. Uh, often it's just the cup that could be the challenge. Maybe it's not presented in the right uh, cup. I have a little glass over here that I have for me to take a little sip. I'm gonna do that right now. And you'll notice that my cup has a lid on it. And it's actually a sippy cup, right? And so sometimes people with dementia can benefit from a, a device like this so that it's really nice and functional. Notice that this cup has a grab, kind of a holding bar on it, right? Like a wrap around. And what I love about this is if my grip is no longer strong or precise or capable, I can easily grab it because of this nice rubberized band around. The lid is also perfectly secure so that if for whatever reason, if I'm not as coordinated as I once was, for whatever reason, now this is particularly true in persons with Parkinson's. And we all know that Parkinson's may be associated with a certain type of dementia known as Parkinson's dementia. And so what a wonderful device for people living with Parkinson's dementia to help them because their grip may be compromised as well as their tendency for a tremor. And so if I need to get more liquids in, I need to have a proper device to support me doing that. So a device like this would be just fantastic. And hydration really is very significant. I want to stay well hydrated so that my risk of having uh, dehydration and having an acute confusional state 
otherwise known as delirium, or having orthostatic hypotension where my blood pressure falls when I stand up and puts me at risk for falling is, is very, very important. Now, there are dozens of other little tips and tricks about uh, reducing falls. I've highlighted only a few of them. There are many really fantastic resources. Uh, our home safety checklist that you'll find in the link uh, on our Facebook page offers additional uh, checks and guidances. Uh, the Alzheimer's Association has some wonderful resources as well. But make no bout to doubt it, as they say, that falls are a real risk in people with dementia. And so hopefully some of the areas I've touched on uh, really have relevance for you in your everyday life, uh, working and living with and loving the person that you're on this journey with uh, who is living with dementia. All right, let's go and move on to another topic related to safety, and that's one near and dear to my heart as a prescriber myself, and that's medications. Um, we know that people with dementia uh, often are no longer capable of taking their own medications. Why is that? Some of that's just because of their memory loss. Some of that's because of confusion. But suffice it to say that they often require assistance with medications. Uh, from the simple act of opening the container uh, to the more complex act of managing their medications, including you know, taking the correct number at the correct time in the correct amount, uh, it's a very complicated scenario. I mean, think of yourself. I know, for example, me, when I'm prescribed a, an antibiotic for a, a, you know, a bad strep infection in my throat, I sometimes am not perfectly adherent to the medication regimen because I forget or I'm busy. And so if those of us who are cognitively intact have challenges with medication, just uh, maintaining the regimen as prescribed, Think of how challenging it is for those living with dementia to take medications safely uh, and according to the way it's been prescribed. Not only that, they could get themselves in harm's way. How so? With medications. Well, you may have medications as the caregiver that you're taking. Uh, you may have others in the home that are taking medications for a short-term concern or maybe a long-term condition. Uh, you may be taking vitamins. You may be taking uh, nutraceuticals. Uh, there are all kinds of medications that might be around your house that could be very concerning if, in fact, your loved one with dementia has an interest in what those little vials are. And they may inadvertently, again, get in harm's way by exploring medication cabinets, exploring pill bottles that are left out on the counter and you know other things that could contribute to them inadvertently taking the wrong medication someone else's medication too much of their own medication and so while it seems rather simplistic medication safety in terms of simply making sure there are childproof lids on all of your medication containers making sure that medication cabinets are locked and secured because there's nothing worse than uh, discovering that my goodness my loved one with dementia has gotten into the medication cabinet and I'm not sure what or if they took anything and that's a very very scary moment so securing medications making sure there are childproof lids is essential now your loved one may benefit from your utilization of what's called a like a medication reminder I'm sure you've seen some of these. They come in like a strip for seven days uh, of the week. They're often plastic and they have little lids that you can lift off. And they're quite nice for folks in the earlier stages of dementia to stay on track with their medications. They present a slight safety risk if your loved one is prone to explore because at any given moment they could take the whole week's supply. So you have to know your loved one well enough to understand if this is a safe strategy for them. Sometimes it's uh, better to just put out the morning dose in a lid that they can appropriately uncover by themselves, and then an afternoon dose as a solo, and then an evening dose or a bedtime dose as a solo. 
and not putting them out all together. Because again, the risk could be that they take them all at once. So we have to be very mindful of medication safety in that regard. We have a question that came through from Mary, and thanks Mary for asking this. My husband gets a little defensive when anyone tries to help him with his medication. What are some strategies to help him let his guard down and accept help? Well, that's a great question. It's also a very common experience. Many times people with dementia may even feel a little paranoid about taking medication. They may be suspect about what you're giving them. And that's a, a unique kind of challenge as well. I think bottom line is try to explore what that defensiveness is coming from. Is he worried that, you know, these aren't his medications? Is he worried, and I've even heard people say, people living with dementia, that um, I think that's poison, those aren't my medications. They get very confused. And so it's really critical that you create a safe environment for them to take their medications in which they feel comfortable. Um, often you can introduce this by saying, oh, you know, it's time to take our morning meds. And maybe you are taking your own medications along with them taking their medications. Now that's great if you have medications, but maybe you don't. Um, maybe you're taking a multivitamin and you don't think of that as a medication, but it's a wonderful shared experience for you to say, oh, you know, it's that time of day, let's take our medications and you do it together. You can also use um, more authoritative, and by that I don't mean being forceful. What I mean is using the reference to a favored and revered uh, healthcare uh, provider in your, in your healthcare equation, such that you say, oh, Dr. Smith wants you to take these medications. And so in that regard, you associate the authority, if you will, Dr. Smith, um, that the client, the patient, your loved one will hopefully remember, and if not, that's okay too, but you can talk with them about the fact that, oh yes, the last time we went to the doctor, this was a very important part of what the doctor wanted you to do. Now that may not work with everybody. Other strategies include using the breakfast time as a standard routine to incorporate the medication um, administration time such that it becomes part of the normal breakfast routine. All right, <clears throat> all right, Fred, you're all done with your oatmeal. It's time to take your medications. The other thing is don't force them, right? You're not going to win that battle. And so if they don't want to take that medication at that very moment, I would say back off. I know that's somewhat uh, controversial because you're going to say, goodness, Sharon, they need those medications. They can't forego them. I understand. But when you get into a battle, uh, usually it's one that you're not going to win. And you're going to have some combativeness, potentially, <clears throat> increased agitation. And so back off and say, all right, let's wait on that. Let's come back to that later. And so then you try again, maybe a half an hour later. And it could be an entirely different experience. I often like to say, you know, three strikes and you're out. And so you may try once and it doesn't work. You kind of reboot and recalibrate. You wait a little while, you try again, still didn't work. And then you reboot, recalibrate and try again. And if that one doesn't work, I think it's time to let that medication go for that particular day. Now, what are the dire consequences there? You need to know your loved one's underlying condition. And if really not taking this medication could be life-threatening, then we have to figure out a way. Maybe it's the nature of that medication. Maybe it's being given in an oral form that the uh, loved one doesn't like swallowing. It's sticking to their tongue. Their mouth isn't moist enough for it to go down easily. Can you crush it? Can you crush it and put it in applesauce? Can you put it in something that they enjoy? But be careful about that, and here's why. I've seen people try to do the right thing and get the loved one to take medications by mixing a crushed medication in something that the client, the, the loved one, truly enjoys. For example, uh, ice cream. 
And, you know, I don't know about you, but a bitter pill in my ice cream doesn't make me like my ice cream. And so we've seen then that the person starts refusing ice cream. And that's not a good outcome either. So you have to be careful about your choice here. But my point is, it might be the nature of the medication itself and crushing it may be a strategy. Maybe a capsule form is a better strategy. Or how about a topical form, whether that's a patch or a gel or an ointment, explore that. Maybe there's a liquid form that would be more easily swallowed than either of those um, other oral options. So consult with your prescriber and see if they have other suggestions or your pharmacist too. Um, often with medication challenges, especially related to swallowing the medication, your pharmacist may have lots of great suggestions. Now, another question came through, just a, a flat out great question. Can a person with Alzheimer's safely manage their own medications? You know, I really believe that people with dementia have great um, strengths in so many ways. And I think that some people with dementia in the early stages can safely manage their medications when they have appropriate supportive uh, individuals in their life and appropriate supportive tools to help them do that. So in the early stages of dementia, that is a possibility. Uh, using one of these medication reminder boxes, and nowadays there are many different devices on, for example, our iPhones or our Androids that can serve as reminders. There can even be alarms that are set uh, to remind individuals to take medications. There are even tools where you can uh, confirm that you've actually taken the medication and that alert, whether you've taken it or frankly, whether you've forgotten to take it, can be sent to a loved one within your network. So there are many um, apps on different devices that can help someone in the early stages of dementia be successful with safely taking their medications. However, I would strongly caution you once an individual with dementia gets more into the middle and late stages that they will need your assistance and the safety is really um, critical because of the lack of judgment and some of the memory loss issues that become worse as the disease progresses, making medication management uh, on their own really un or inadvisable, right? All right, so that's a lot about medications. I'm sure I could answer many more questions and we'll keep watching the chat for more questions. And uh, if I have any other tips that I think of, I'll be sure to uh, add those on. All right, so moving on to wondering. That's a big topic, isn't it? Uh, there's a question that has come through from Erica. So thank you, Erica, for asking. You ask, my dad has Alzheimer's and has started wondering, how do we keep him safe without being overbearing? That's a great question and it's really a common concern of many families that have loved ones living with dementia. So let's talk about wondering in general. Six out of 10 individuals with dementia wander. That's an enormously high rate. So if your loved one has not already exhibited wandering, be prepared for it. And so one of my big important messages is be prepared. Because of the high rate of wandering amongst individuals living with dementia, it's something that you have to frankly expect to happen. Now you may be one of the lucky ones and it never happens, but you don't want to find yourself in the situation where your loved one has begun to wander and now you're really in a distraught and disturbing and very, very stressful situation. So my first message is expect it and be prepared. How so? Make sure at a minimum that you have a recent photo of your loved one easily accessible and at your disposal to share with authorities who may need to be involved in a search. So have a recent photo. Number two, have current information about your loved one everything from their height, their weight, uh, their eye color, uh, their date of birth, how old they are, any medical conditions, and anything else that would be unique about your loved one in helping to identify them. 
So keep important information about your loved one easily at hand that could be you know, simply written down. Better yet, in this age of all the wonderful technology platforms, keep that information in your smartphone, on your computer, uh, so that again, it can be readily shared for anyone involved in a potential search for your loved one. Third point, consider enrolling in some of the wonderful programs that allow for a national database search, again, should your loved one get lost uh, while they are out wandering. What's a great example? Well, wonderful uh, service that the National Alzheimer's Association provides is called the Safely Home Program. Oh, excuse me, that's, let me check the exact name of that. I wanna make sure I have it right. Yes, um, the Alzheimer's Association has a wonderful program and you can sign up for that on their website and it's a medic alert bracelet that your loved one wears and they get logged into a national database so that if, God forbid, they ever do get lost, they can wear a medic alert bracelet or a medic alert uh, necklace and they can be put on a national database so that others can be alerted and it's a wonderful, wonderful service. Now, let's also think about why people with dementia may wander. Why do they wonder? Sometimes it's because they're looking for something, right? They are confused. They may not understand once they've awoken that they're in their own home. They may not recognize familiar surroundings. And as strange as that sounds, that actually can happen to people with dementia. Uh, they are getting up and walking around trying to figure out where they are. They may need to go to the bathroom and they may have forgotten even in their own home where their bathroom is. And so they begin to wonder, they begin to search. Other reasons people with dementia may wonder. Uh, patterns, uh, well established, long standing patterns in their life. They may be at a time in their dementia journey that they are believing that they are still working and they need to get to work. And they're going to go out uh, the door to find their car to get to work. Um, one of the analogies I love to share that helps many people that I've worked with, families, uh, caregivers, professional caregivers, in thinking about individuals with dementia and their propensity to wander and to be sort of uh, traveling back in time into their own time and space is this analogy, and maybe it'll help you too. I often think of people with dementia as time travelers, and a beautiful analogy is to think of them as being in the basket of a hot air balloon. And I think many of you have maybe certainly seen a photo of a hot air balloon, some of you may have even traveled, uh, had a lovely experience in a hot air balloon. And if you think about that basket, right, it's this you know, kind of beautiful wicker basket that you know, you're in. And on top of that is this beautiful air-filled you know, balloon. A person with dementia, metaphorically speaking, is in this basket of this hot air balloon. The hot air balloon ascends into the sky. And metaphorically speaking, the person with dementia is sort of you know, floating back through their past. And eventually, the hot air balloon lands. They get out of that basket and they're in a time and space somewhere in their past that seems very real to them, right? Now, of course, this is all metaphorical. It's not real, they're not actually time traveling, but it has helped so many individuals that I've worked with and I've supported in their dementia journey to have this idea to help them better understand that at any given point in time, an individual living with dementia may have this quote unquote time travel experience where they have sort of floated back in time and landed in this metaphorical hot air balloon, exited the basket, and it's very real to them what they're experiencing. And so while that analogy may be helpful to us having empathy and understanding 
about how real that experience may seem to them, what is the practical approach then? Well, we often say enter their reality, right? Instead of denying where they're at, accept it and kind of go with the flow. Now, some people have challenged me about that to say, you know, Sharon, that's sort of like feeding into their delusions. I understand the concern people may have about that, but many of you know when you try to dispute the reality the person living with dementia believes they're in, that frequently does not go well. You often encounter agitation and sometimes even combativeness because they simply won't accept our reality when they're in theirs. So going with the flow and perhaps reminiscing about the activity they believe that they're about to embark upon. For example, going to work. So if your loved one leaves the home and is thinking they need to go to work, it's great to talk with them about their work. You know, Fred, I remember the work you did as an accountant. That was quite the job you had. Weren't you the first one ever to discover that new methodology of calculating, you know, whatever that might be? Now, I'm not an accountant, so that's hard for me to think of a typical example. But if your loved one is, I bet you have many examples that you can make a connection with them about to distract them from their efforts. Or, better yet, is walk with them. Sometimes when they get out of our home, out of the safe environment, and we're worried about them getting in harm's way, and we may be tempted to, you know, run after them and try to bring them back, like physically uh, maneuver them to coming back. Again, that can result in some very difficult and challenging scenarios. So it's often better to walk with them and talk about where they are going, what are they looking for, and to reassure them that you're there to help them stay safe, that you have something waiting for them back at home. Or one of the other strategies that sometimes works is to ask them for help. You know, I have a roast in the oven and I need to get back to making sure it doesn't burn. Or if our little dog Georgie gets out of the house when we're away, I'm concerned that he'll get into trouble. Could you come with me and go make sure that Georgie's okay, right? So often distracting them with a reasonable explanation as to why they need to get back home can be very helpful. Now, other things that you can do sort of proactively to help reduce the likelihood of wandering is making sure that they have a day filled with purpose and engagement. Oftentimes, people living with dementia are simply bored. Uh, They may get up and begin to walk around the home and look for things to do. And that may lead them to want to look outdoors for something to do. And so filling their day with purpose and meaning is a great strategy. Not just busy work, not just watching television all day, but things they really enjoy doing and can get engaged and involved in. Uh, Maybe it's making a favorite recipe, 